All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Uh, this is a topic I've been wanting to cover for uh, a while now. Before I did this work, I was working at an organization which was involved in mindfulness meditation. So even prior to that, it was a passion of mine, which is how I ended up uh, pursuing that role. And doing a lot of work with men on their physical and mental health, it becomes more and more apparent to me over time how needed mindfulness is uh, as part of a holistic protocol for working with men's mental health. So if you've if you're familiar with meditation, if you've done a whole bunch of it, then you probably don't need to watch this. There is a segment in here on uh, mindfulness meditation and TRT, which might be relevant. But for most people, this is going to be like a, kind of like a 101 thing. So it's a very broad topic. I'm not going to go into everything in too much detail, but I do want to give you guys enough information to you know wrap up with with a good understanding of not only what it is, but why you should be doing it. So Firstly, just a couple of definitions. Now, everyone's got different definitions of mindfulness. Everyone's got different definitions of meditation. I don't think there is a agreed on definition. So these are some that I like. So I see mindfulness as the mental skill of attention. Uh, and meditation is the practice of training the mental skill of attention. So you go to the gym to get big and strong or, or whatever your goals are. So going to the gym or sorry going to the gym is like meditation it's the practice of doing that and then mindfulness is the ability to be big and strong the ability to you know pick something up or move something out of your way or, or however that strength serves you in day-to-day -day life so mindfulness is the skill meditation is the practice and then when we look at different types of meditation there are all different types but the type that i've done most of my research on and most of my practice in has been mindfulness meditation so mindfulness meditation is a practice or a form of meditation uh, that involves focusing on the present moment. And then the way that you do that is through a series of, of, of different, what I call anchors. So points that you focus on in your awareness to make you aware of the present moment. So the breath you know, is a common one. So why should you do some form of meditation? So the, for me, the way I look at this is that the importance of meditation is creating a buffer between the stimulus and the response. So the buffer between the, the action and the reaction. So this puts us in more control of not only how we feel, but also how we respond to things and how we show up in the world. So this skill allows us to be more in control of our actions and our emotions in day-to-day -day life, as well as experiencing a better subjective sense of well-being. Because if we can put things into perspective regularly, whether it's zooming out of small problems or looking, you know, planning long-term goals or even being more grateful and choosing to be grateful for the things that we have rather than longing for the things that we don't have, we are going to experience a better general day-to-day -day experience of life. So this gives us more gratitude, more focus, the ability to choose to focus on a specific, a specific task that may not be that enjoyable, which is difficult more resilience, more goal setting, and more empathy. You know, we can make the choice to put on someone else's shoes and actually take a moment to look at, okay, why is this person responding the way that they are? And how would I feel if I was in that situation? That is a choice that we have to make. It's a choice that we have to go through to practice these uh, acts of empathy. So it also ultimately gives us more control. I think a lot of people whether it's consciously or subconsciously and their actions are looking for more control. Maybe they feel out of control, so they try to control other things and that may not be a helpful way to deal with things. But meditation does put you more in the driver's seat of your life because it allows you to be more conscious in the present moment of what you're doing. So you're more able to make better decisions. You're more able to make decisions rationally and logically rather than reacting to things. So Jocko Willink in one of his, uh, it's like a speech or a podcast or something, uh, refers to this as mind control in the sense that it's not about controlling someone else's mind, it's about the skill of controlling your own mind. And when you can control your own mind, this gives you a, uh, you know, there's a guy called Dan Harris who calls it a superpower. Um, it gives you a lot of uh, skills and options and, and resilience to things that you otherwise wouldn't usually have. And it's not something that comes naturally it may come more naturally to some people over others but at the end of the day i see mindfulness and i see the skill of attention as something that has to be taught if a child doesn't know how to tie their shoelace we don't assume there's something wrong with a child we assume they haven't been taught how to tie their shoelace and i think that we have to choose to practice this skill of attention we have to be taught how to focus and then there are different things that we do in life that help strengthen and practice this skill 
And the last thing, it allows you to think before you do in real time. That's the outcome of mindfulness to me. You know, they always say, you know, think before you act, think before you say, and that's all well and good, but it's hard to do that in the stress of things. When things are going on, the more stressful the situation, often the harder it is to take a step back and think before you say or do. So it's allowing you to have this skill set, not in hindsight, when we go, oh shit, maybe I shouldn't have said that, maybe I shouldn't have done that. It allows us to have this in real time. So how does it work? So meditation works to train the prefrontal cortex and produce something called alpha brainwaves. And this is part of the brain that controls attention and executive function. So we've got alpha brainwaves and we've got beta brainwaves. And beta brainwaves are more associated or, or causative, sorry, with more scattered thinking, whereas alpha brainwaves are more to do with focus and attention. So meditation allows us to become more aware of the observer and, and the mind as two different I guess entities is a good way to look at it. So you've got, and there are different practices and there are different schools of thought that will have different names for this. And this is a bit less scientific, but I think it's a good way to learn about what they are because you've got to put labels to things to learn them. So The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle is a really good example of, of creating this distinction between what is the mind and then what is me or what is the self or who am I and who is the ego and getting into understanding that there's there's kind of two things going on there and Tim Ferriss calls it the monkey mind or the analytical mind is another way to call it. But it's understanding that you are not your mind. And when you can create this separation, you can kind of use the mind more as a tool that allows you to do what you want to do. And again, Jocko talks about this as mind control so that you can do the things that you want to do. You can think the way that you want to think. And this is a skill and it's something that does need to be learned, just like deadlifting. You know, a lot of people can hurt themselves lifting something really heavy because they haven't learned to lift with their backs properly. So something it also does structurally is it increases gray matter. The opposite to this white matter is uh, related and a part of the prognosis or the uh, sorry, part of the outcome of neurodegeneration. So gray matter is kind of like kind of think of it as like putting on muscle. White matter is like putting on fat. So it's putting on more of the good stuff in the brain. Um, and it also reduces the size and the activation of something called the amygdala. And the amygdala is like the alarm bell in the brain. So when the amygdala gets active from stress or what we perceive as stress, then this will signal the adrenals to produce stress hormones and this creates the stress response. So when we look at the neural imaging scans of mindfulness meditation interventions for eight weeks, we actually see a physical increase in the prefrontal cortex, which is associated with impulse control and executive function and a reduction in the size of the amygdala, which is this alarm bell for stress. So the question is, what does this have to do with TRT? And that's a good question. And that's one of my main areas of interest in, uh, well, firstly, it was kind of what got me into testosterone in terms of how it works with the brain. And then I was also very interested in, well, what does mindfulness do as a scientific practice, as a uh, neuropsychiatric practice, as opposed to a, a spiritual practice? And one thing that testosterone does is it facilitates dopamine transmission. So it does this in a lot of ways. So it's not something like an amphetamine or a stimulant that increases dopamine like an agonist does. It facilitates dopamine to occur and be metabolized and utilized properly in the appropriate circumstances. So when we've got low testosterone, it's not why it causes anhedonic depression. It's the mechanism by which the anhedonic, the lack of pleasure, depression comes to pass. So mindfulness meditation allows us to heal unresolved traumas through integration and self-inquiry. It allows us to sit and come to terms with things and integrate things that have happened with us so that we're no longer fearful, we're no longer afraid. And it's something that comes when you spend time sitting and being at peace and being in control of your mind. You kind of do this almost spring cleaning of you know residual thoughts and residual things that you may be holding onto that are unresolved. And when we alter our baseline state with therapeutic testosterone after a period of a low testosterone state, we are in a much more internally resilient state to heal some of these issues that we may have experienced. So it's almost like self-therapy, but it's self-therapy that can occur because we've changed the inner, we've, we've fixed the foundation and we're showing ourselves that the foundation is now fixed and we can rebuild and we can build ourselves into ultimately the man that we want to be. It's the, the testosterone injections they will facilitate this process occurring, but they will not be the thing that allows us to overcome the learned fear that has built and manifested over this period of low testosterone. So testosterone also antagonizes the effects of stress hormones. So it has opposing actions to a hormone like cortisol. 
which is how, again, low testosterone can make us more vulnerable to becoming traumatized, and it can make us more vulnerable to chronic feelings of anxiety and stress because we are going through the world in a biologically less resilient state. So again, testosterone replacement therapy facilitates the healing of this system, but we actually have to go in and do the work. And mindfulness meditation, as well as physical training, like you know, uh, lifting weights, powerlifting, cardio, martial arts, etc. That's how we heal the physical body. But mindfulness meditation isn't the only tool, but it is a very powerful tool to heal the internal body. And it's free, and all you have to do is just sit there. So the other thing as well is that when we look at testosterone and its metabolized metabolite DHT, DHT promotes and facilitates GABA transmission as well as norepinephrine transmission. So this is, these are the neurochemicals that are responsible for like a aggressive yet calm driven state. So it's it's like the testosterone is putting the the chemical foundation in there for you to build yourself into the kind of man that you're wanting and hoping to be with the treatment. It's just, you need to go in and actually do this work. Just like you need to go to the gym. You also need to sit down and, and work on your inner dialogue. So how to do it? That's the big question. So I recommend the apps uh, headspace. And I, I think there's one called waking up or it used to be called waking up. Someone might need to check that for me by a guy called Sam Harris. And there's also one called Smiling Minds for Children, um, if you've got children who you're wanting to teach to meditate. But Headspace and Waking Up are my two favorites, and they're very different. So when you're meditating, it's important that you're not getting pissed off or judging the person narrating the meditation for you. So it's important that you find a narrator that you don't find to be obtrusive or you don't find to be frustrating. So they're two very different ways of meditating that headspace is more analogies and animations and it's a more calming soothing voice sam harris is a lot more straight to the point so it depends on which one you respond to best i prefer headspace i recommend headspace for most people i've been using headspace since very very early days when it came out and i think it's a fantastic uh, way to learn to meditate the the progression through the app kind of like the progressive overload in fitness that the progression through learning the skills the durations the way things are explained, I think is done very, very, very well. Um, I don't have any financial, there's no affiliate code. Um, I also recommend focusing on frequency rather than volume. So I'm using a bodybuilding term here. So in terms of when we're looking at training volume, which is often what we look at, you know, in, in you know, I guess bodybuilding or any kind of weightlifting, we're looking at, you know, how many sets and reps or weight per week. Meditation is more about the actual practice of focusing on the present moment and disrupting that monkey mind it's the process of how often or how regularly can you come back to that present moment and that's the important thing with meditation so i don't like people to look at it as doing you know a, a session a week or a few sessions a week you got to do it daily even if it's only for a few minutes daily is good twice a day is best but i really recommend people commit to a daily practice and five ten minutes is plenty to start with even personally I don't really find that much benefit going beyond 15 or 20 minutes. I think for most people, 10 minutes is a really good sweet spot. And you should be able to find a time in the day where you can do it. You just have to make it a priority. And with meditation, it, it seems to be the thing that a lot of people know they should be doing or they, they'll find any excuse to put it off. It'll be the last thing to do. And it's just about finding a time to sit down and do it and develop that discipline to have it as part of your you know daily routine or your daily practice. So the important thing is when you're learning meditation and the apps will teach you how to do this, the important thing that that I explain to people is that it's not about, just like when you go and deadlift, it's not about picking up a weight and just holding it, unless that's what you're training static holds. But for the most part, it's not about just picking up and holding it. With meditation, it's not about just holding your attention in the present moment, because when you first start, that's going to be very difficult to do. The practice of meditation is about allowing and observing the mind wandering off and then bringing your attention back to the present moment and that's kind of like doing a rep so every time the mind wanders off it's not a i failed or oh, i couldn't focus very long or oh, i just kept thinking they're opportunities for you to pick that weight back up again otherwise with weightlifting the question is well, what's the point of putting it down you're putting it down so you can pick it back up so if you look at every opportunity that you lose focus in meditation as an opportunity to practice becoming aware of that and bringing your attention back to the present moment, that's what builds the skill over time. And it's really important to focus on that. Then over time, when you meditate more, you will naturally spend longer and longer in this state. But I believe it's because you are quicker to bring your attention back when you get when it wanders off. And then naturally over time, you can hold that attention for longer and longer and longer. 
And the longer you spend in that present aware state is what I believe has all the uh, neurobiological benefits is how long you can over time spend, even if it's only a few seconds of time, if you're doing that every day for months and weeks and years, how long you spend in that state, I believe is what have, has all the protective uh, effects of meditation on the brain. So, and I also recommend sticking with an app for a while. It's like, if you go to the gym, you want to get a personal trainer to teach you the skills that you need and the apps over time, they are about progressing. So meditation should be about progressing. It's about learning new skills. It's about learning new ways to focus. It's about learning new anchors and new sensations in the body as you're learning the skill over time. So you always want to be improving and developing. So eventually you can get to a point where you can just meditate with music. You can meditate with the sound of nature. You can just sit in silence. But until you've got the skill to do that, it's really important to use now. So my tips is to apply mindfulness in the real world. So take the time in your day-to-day -day interactions to think about how someone else is feeling or to how, or sorry, how to become aware of how you're responding to people around you, become aware of how you're showing up, become aware of, is your breathing shallow, how your body language is, are you taking the moment to appreciate maybe a win or maybe a goal that you achieved, are you giving yourself credit where credit's due, all of those things are to do with being aware of your inner monologue and how you're feeling. So the other thing as well in terms of how to apply mindfulness is going, okay, this is how I'm feeling, but what does that actually mean? And that's why it's really important some days to practice mindfulness and wake up and go, ah, okay, I don't feel well today. I don't feel like going to the gym. Okay, that's how I feel, but I'm disciplined and I'm going to do it anyway and make a choice. So mindfulness is not about constantly becoming aware of how you feel and becoming obsessive over how you're feeling. It's becoming aware of how you feel and then about becoming aware of how you want to be, what your goals are and what needs to be done, and then prioritizing that. So it's about creating this new relationship with your mind and finding times in the day to practice that is very important because the more you practice it, the more profound your meditations become when you practice this skill, just like going to the gym. So the other thing is get back on the bike when you've fallen off. So if, if you're meditating every day for a week or two weeks or a month, and then you forget don't throw it out the window. Just come back to it. Always come back to it. Meditation is one of those things where you absolutely develop inertia. You develop momentum. It gets better and more rewarding the more often you do it. But it is important when you get off that bike to go, ah, okay, shit, you know, I haven't done it for a week or a month or even a year and just start again from day one. It's the most important thing you can do. Um, understand that the time spent meditating is more productive than most things. So five to 10 minutes of meditation will have huge productivity outcomes in everything else you do in the other you know 16 17 hours that you're awake that day so it is an important time investment in the other things that you get done find a practice or a way of meditating that works for you so i like to sit on a couch cross-legged works well for me supports my back that's the position i find work really well other people i don't really recommend lying down unless you have to some people like sitting up cross-legged some people like sitting up in a chair some people like going for a walk and meditating. Find what works for you. Find whatever you're going to do and do it. Uh, I also recommend learning martial arts. I think martial arts is a cool way to practice meditation because now the question is, how well can you retain your executive function in a stressful, violent situation? So I think that martial arts is the yang and meditation is like the yin in terms of this balance. Um, understand the relationship between your body and your mind. So when you do check in for a meditation, you notice that your shoulders or your back are sore and then you notice that it's more difficult to calm your mind, you can learn that there's a relationship between the body and the mind and how the body feels impacts the mind and how the mind feels impacts the body. And that way you can learn to heal yourself and give yourself self-therapy through the forms of things like yoga and stretching and sauna and ice baths. Um, I also recommend for anyone who wants to try meditation after watching this video to go on YouTube and search Alan Watts 15 minute guided meditation watch the one that specifies there's no ad in the middle. I don't know which genius decided to put an ad in the middle of meditation, but it's fucking stupid. But there's one that's a 15 minute one that I think is the best guided meditation for the first time or hundredth timer. I think it is a phenomenal way to learn and be introduced to meditation through the practice of it. So highly recommend that one. So that's it for me. I uh, hope you guys found that useful and I will see you on the next one.